Hi, I'm Tony Chen. Welcome to The Ties That Bind. These are the stories of the descendants of the Chinese workers who helped build the CPR in Canada. In Chinese, it's called Tian Lo, Iron Road. The Chinese role in building the Canadian Pacific Railway began at 11 a.m. on May 14, 1880, with the blasting of a firing cap in Yale, B.C. I'm sure everyone's heard of the documentary Gold Mountain, uh, but in uh, Toison, there was a recruit, recruiter and recruitment. There was a, a, an active recruitment initiative that took place in the province where my uh, family comes from, in Toison, uh, near Slum Fao. And so at the time of the building of the railroad, uh, back in uh, the uh, 1800s, uh, that impact uh, trickled down from one generation to the other in terms of the uh, quest uh, to come to Canada and that Canada, the vision and the perception that Canada was Gold Mountain. If you look at the history of China in those days, there was famine. There was hardships for uh, people feeding their families. They like to romanticize that expedition, but if you really think about people coming from China not knowing uh, the language and suffering the weather, working outdoors in a labor capacity, yeah, it, it was pretty tough. You could call it Gumsan now and people can make publications and write books and uh, do projects, but you know, there was documentation on how many lives were lost. And for people to exclude them at the end for the photo ops or the historical uh, record, that's a travesty. Well, a lot of them initially came from the south because they were working from, for the other railroads. Uh, you know, the American Railroad uh, uh, contract system finished, they built the railroad down there. So, and that's why I think it was Honor Don proposed the railroad to start here because there was a labor pool that was available and experienced people that can work on it. And of course, as they, they needed more people, uh, you know, it became very politically expedient to start recruiting. And the recruiting grounds are probably mostly from Hong Kong, Amoy, and some of the uh, international settlements that were then given to the, uh, to the foreign powers in China. And also, uh, there are people probably even from Manila, you know, because there were Chinese enclaves that was as far south in that. And there were probably Chinese as far down as Mexico that were coming out from Peru and Mexico that were coming out for the work. So the recruitment was fairly broad and fairly comprehensive. It's not just simply one avenue or just one contractor. My father was Hong Yan Yang. He came to Canada with the first shipment of workers from China that was recruited in China back in the Nothing was supplied at that time. They came in coolie hats and their pigtails and whatever they wore at that time, which was probably cotton shoes and cotton clothing. They didn't have gloves, hats, boots, or any of the necessities for, for our Canadian winter. Grandpa came over, we were thinking uh, 1871 by boat. Um, not even sure which boat he came on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're assuming he probably landed uh, New West. Um, at that point in time, the railway was being built, uh, there was a gold rush up in Barkerville. Um, so he would have taken the paddle wheel up to Yale. Mm -hmm. Yale was a land point, that's as far as you could go with with the boat, and just uh, and then from there up into the Caribou. As far as we know, he worked on a railway. Um, he lost a finger, and from what we understand was once he lost a finger, he didn't want to die. 
just really, really primitive conditions mm -hmm. and not being aware of how mm -hmm. cold it is mm -hmm. up in the Fraser Canyon um, during the winter and to, you know, basically have no, not the proper clothing, not the proper footwear, um, definitely nothing for safety. Canada was a new country, and many stayed to start a new life. They had endured harsh conditions and now faced harsher racist legislation to run businesses, nurture a community, and to raise their children. My great-grandfather, um, some in the family call him Willie Nip, others call him Nip -n. Willie Nip, or Nip -n, came over in 1881 to work on the railroad, and he worked there between 1881 to 1884. Now, after working on the railroad, he left the railroad and um, went into, became a merchant and he was one of the first Chinese merchants ever in Cumberland and in Victoria. Dad's memory of Grandpa isn't really big either because when Grandpa died, Dad would have been seven. But the stories are basically that the conditions were really primitive, it was really cold, it wasn't safe, and Grandpa decided he wasn't going to do this anymore. So he opened up a little grocery store. So mm -hmm. he ended up with a grocery store, a temple, a cherry orchard, a still, and uh, some houses of uh, gaming. Eventually he came down to Vancouver here, mm -hmm. and he set up, uh, if you go down to the Chang Association, you take a look at the very top of the um, portraits, his grandfather's picture. He was one of the first donators to purchase that land and help build the building for the Cheng Association. It was a male-dominated society, right? The only two opportunities uh, that they could actually get into was service. So you either cooked for a family, uh, for example, you were the hop sing of Bonanza, mm -hmm. or uh, you do what my grandfather did and uh, continue in the laundry business. And those were the only two uh, business opportunities that they offered the males. As soon as the CPR was completed, Canada imposed the first of three head taxes on Chinese immigrants. First, it was $50 by 1904. It was 500. My grandfather uh, was Mr. Ralph Lunke Lee. Grandfather was one of the uh, six rare living head taxpayers at the time of the Prime Minister's apology on June 22, 2006. His memory of the of the head tax was uh, paying back to the family uh, by washing dishes. So he was basically interned to the family to to one of my uncles or a family member uh, to wash dishes for a number of years. It took him approximately five five years of washing dishes. And so that memory is a very ugly memory because uh, the um, being a, a young a young boy wanting to go to school and instead uh, having to wash dishes to pay the family debt and uh, came to Canada when I was a youngster, five years old youngster, and uh, had to pay the head tax, which is uh, $500, and my mother had to pay head tax, $500, total of $1,000, which was an enormous sum of money in those days. That was 1922. It took my father 17 years to repay this thousand dollar loan, even though the people that loaned them the money did not have to charge one penny for interest. As a boy of 12, my family couldn't afford to keep me at home because he couldn't afford to, to provide me with, with food and, and lodging. So I had to go out on my own. I had to go to, uh, to another town to uh, uh, go to school as well as uh, waiting tables and so on, and wash dishes, and clean the floor. Mm -hmm. Twelve years old boy. This is the hardship that I had to endure. 
The whole purpose of the uh, implementation of the attacks was to stop Chinese immigrants being awarded the Canadian citizenship. He had no idea that he was subjected to it as well. That just goes to show that the citizenship meant nothing. Totally, totally nil. Which was quite sad because he had to pay all three of them X number of times. The cruelest act came on July 1st, 1923. Ironically, on Dominion Day. Now it's called Canada Day. To the Chinese, it was Humiliation Day, when Canada slammed the door shut on Chinese immigrants. It caused unspeakable hardship on the community. I've always kind of been curious about um, why my father was a paper son, because my great-grandfather had been here, and he paid the head tax and all that. Um, that, that process that everybody in that generation went through. So I was always wondering why did my dad need to become a paper son? Uh, paper son is um, because of the head tax and exclusion act prevented uh, families to continue the bloodline in North America, not just Canada but in the Caribbean, uh, US and here, basically all of the Americas. And so the restriction kind of resulted um, this I guess it was sort of an underground movement um, and it was illegal. A lot of people that went back to China ended up like selling uh, or um, selling their papers or, and then people that wanted to come here that didn't have kind of connection here yet would buy an, an identity and, and take that on as their identity to get to America. After uh, the Second World War, a lot of documentation was lost. So the Canadian government accepted the idea of an affidavit. So you can swear that, say, okay, I have, you know, uh, I am so-and-so, I have a wife, and her name is so-and-so, and I have two sons. And some people, they might have only one son, but, you know, they actually have an extra paper, and they will either give that paper to somebody, or they might sell it, you know, to finance, you know, their family's trip, and so on and so forth. So this was made, it was an illegal attempt to do this stuff, but they had no choice. They're, you know, family reunion is no choice. This family, these people were immigrants. And the whole diabolical thing about the 1923 Exclusion Act was that they were hoping, the white population was hoping that at the end of this whole tenure, and they felt it would go forever, at some point there'd be no Chinese left in continental Canada. During that exclusion period, uh, my grandfather did travel to China several times, but he wasn't able to bring uh, my mother or my aunt, my grandmother, over until the Exclusion Act was lifted in 47. So my relatives came in and around 1940. It, it was about 1949. But during that exclusion period, my uncle, who I didn't have the chance to meet, died uh, over in China. Had he been allowed to come here, he probably it, his outcome perhaps would have been different, or uh, you know, my grandfather would have been allowed to have that relationship with, with my uncle uh, had he not been excluded. The old people kind of looked out for my dad by arranging a marriage. You know, whether people want to talk about it, that's what they did. My dad had never met my mom until she got off the plane. In those days, uh, Chinese is pretty well uh, cannot work for any white people. They won't take you. That's uh, that's uh, uh, discrimination against the Chinese, and they they won't take they won't take you. Uh, just like in my case, in the, in my days, hockey players were not paid like they were paid now. Uh, I was a hockey player, but I went to make a team to to uh, get a job, to to make myself a living, and uh, and there the discrimination on me was. They always say that the head office don't want Chinese to work for it, and I can't work. Well, my father, I, I know that he, um, 
he shared a lot of stories about how difficult it was for him um, <clears throat> as an Asian uh, person of Asian descent, how, how, how he had to suffer through a lot of um, racist incidents. We relate one incident like some old Chinese, uh, elderly Chinese man was in uh, what is considered now the downtown Nissan, East Hastings in Gore Street. And he was um, being robbed by some, uh, some young white thugs at the time. My father stepped in and, you know, um, and I think it was a, an officer, police officer, and they, they just turned a blind eye and just let this incident happen. My father tried to stop it and he says, I know, um, he, you know, he shouted and yelled and they just said, you weren't even scared. But he said, that sort of um, uh, feeling he, he developed that there really was no true justice as he grew up. And even though I'm of mixed heritage myself, I, I remember as a child, and this bothered me tremendously for, for years uh, that we came home from school crying one day because they called us yellow ice cream, um, which was the funniest thing to call us yellow ice cream, but it bothered me because I knew the intent behind it really was, uh, was uh, anti-Chinese sentiment. Believe it or not, to this day I still feel it, that, uh, that there was that, that discrimination and it um, it makes you don't you you don't have the confidence of doing things. Probably the f thing that struck me the most is um, my dad gave it away, but on his birth certificate it said "born in Canada, not a Canadian citizen." That struck me the hardest. Okay, he's born here. They couldn't go to uh, English school. They weren't allowed to go to English school. So my grandmother, which is Nsi's daughter, oldest daughter, Kate, she didn't know how to read or write in English. So it's, but she was very, all the children were, and, and all the girls too, were very um, well versed in Chinese. So even though there was no English school for them, they learned to read and write well in Chinese. So when he yeah. came back, all right, and then they said to him, they said to him, well, you're Chinese. You can't be an engineer. He, said, he says, I want to go to university. You know, it's promised. You know, you, you serve in the forces, you're supposed to get education out of it. Well, no, what do you want to take engineering for? You won't be allowed to be an engineer. What do you want to be a doctor for? You can't be a doctor. You know, we're not going to professionally license you or, or a lawyer. So ended up, three brothers that went overseas ended up being tailors. You know, so there was that that bar that you couldn't, you know, you, you couldn't do a lot of things. When the war broke out, he wanted to join to serve his country. He was very patriotic that way, but at that time when he went to, to the office to, to sign up, they said that they couldn't allow him to register because he was Chinese, which was kind of unusual at the time because he was a member of the BC Dragoons and he had a gun. Yet they wouldn't let him join the Air Force. And I, I think this was quite pr prevalent with a lot of Chinese people that wanted to join when the war first broke out. So then I, I, I know that he sent a letter to the Prime, prime Minister complaining and stuff, stuff like that, he, like he really wanted to, to, to join. And if eventually he was allowed to join. So he finally got in, in the Air Force and he was stationed in Winnipeg, I think in Rivers, Manitoba, and he was a wireless operator and they basically flew training flights. So he never did get to go overseas, though he wanted to. I think he was proud to be a Canadian and I think he was certainly very uh, so proud that he would do so much to get in, but I don't think he was any different than any other Chinese people that signed up for the services during, during, during the war. You know, they had come over or they were born here. This was their country. Their country was in need and they were going to do their, their, their best yeah. to be a a Canadian. But the fact was that these people were trained and they were willing to die for the country. But the sad thing was that many of them never saw action because the war finished before they were sent in to do their job. And if they were sent in, there would be huge casualties because they were sent in in the front lines to do the sabotage and also to create the, you know, the, the environment for the, uh, the eventual landing. They were, came back as heroes and they in some ways took on the mantle. And they were ones that said, we, we got the vote, we actually voted during, during our, the war, 
And uh, now that we're back, we have the, the right now to go to, can to, to government and ask for that for the rest of our, our, our people. After a 20-year national campaign for redress, a day of reckoning came. On June 22, 2006, Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologizes for decades of legislated discrimination. The best thing that came out of the apology was the educational aspect. Uh, the whole of Canada, and even other parts of the world, including my friends in New Zealand and even in the United States, learned about the part of Canadian history, which I think was the most meaningful aspect of this whole effort. As for history itself, um, with today's society, we're just so distracted by so many things, we're going to forget, but because there's going to be a legacy, it will be documented. And I think future generations will benefit from the richness that is Canada in terms of um, how this place came and, and all the ugly warts that came along with it. Eventually, the newer immigrant Chinese Canadians and the ones like myself of, uh, you know, um, multi-generational and, and low IQ as we call it, they will intermarry, they will inherit each other's history. And after a while, um, I think all Canadians will be proud of um, the, the right thing. In, in other words, not forgetting this part of Canada's history. I think it had to come. Um, it took a lot of pressure, um, a lot of you know, activists that I, th I, I think had as much passion as my dad um, to get this, this through. Um, as for the amount, you can never cover the amount. It, you know, it's, it, it's, it was wrong, right? And, and I, I think the greatest thing is that the recognition of the wrong and, and not to have the wrong happen again. I gave, gave uh, Harper considerable credit for, for, for apologizing. At the same time, uh, 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 giving respect to uh, uh, symbolic money. It's not that I'd, we need it, but, but, but to, due to the fact that they acknowledge the fact that, uh, that Canada be treated uh, her Chinese Canadian citizens, and it's well, well deserved. We're in Canada, we're in a beautiful country, and I think um, it's necessary to contribute. It's wonderful to be from wherever the home is that you had, but now that you're in this country, I think it's appreciative to be contributing to this country, but at the same time, understand your own background and appreciate it. And that's what my grandfather and my dad and my uncle always instilled, he says, my grandfather says, just remember that you're Chinese, remember who you are, that's the important thing. Remember who you are. You're Chinese, but you're Canadian, but you're Chinese. And, and, and that's, the, I think that's the, the secret of being a real Canadian. If you know where you came from, you can be a Canadian. You gotta have a foot in both cultures to become a real person, else you lose your identity. They always have been good examples of, you know, good citizens. You know, I give the old folks credit that they, you know, they put out, put out the, they lived by these principles and they, you know, they still knew that they had to work hard, but they, you know, they're not bitter. You know, they, you know, they talk about the head tax, but they, they you know, they, I think they, most of them have forgotten about it. I remember the things that went through my head when I was in the village, standing in Gold Mountain, thinking, what if, you know, the fact that these guys had to get on a boat and go across the ocean, you know, going to an unknown land to do some manual labors in a foreign country where the weather is, you know, totally different, mm -hmm. for them to go on a whim and a prayer, and you think, gee, if they hadn't done that, 
and then you look at your surroundings, it's like, where would we be? That's a pretty humbling experience. I think the, the thing you have to be very proud of is, is what some of your ancestors, what they've done to get Canada to where they are. Whether it be negative and the discrimination and, you know, the railroad building, the dangerous jobs and all of that, but what they've really accomplished. And also, I guess, what they've accomplished that's much better had they never ever left and did not come to Canada. You should be proud of this and you should also go back and visit the history of how your family came to be. I think it's so important because the histories will get lost. If you're here in Canada, I think their opportunities are, are limitless and, and you can really take advantage of that and do anything you really want to be. Without the uh, contribution of the Chinese railroad uh, labors and without the contribution of the Chinese sweat and blood, this country that we're living in today would not be the, the strong and free and uh, economically privileged country uh, that we are today. Uh, it's directly because of the Chinese uh, laborers and the Chinese contribution that we are afforded the freedom and the rights of this beautiful land today. And so to just um, embrace that every day and never take that for granted and to just appreciate everything that this country has to offer. I think that this is an important part of our Canadian history for all Canadians, not just for Chinese Canadians. So that's uh, those are my parting words in, in terms of the preservation and the acknowledgement of um, how do we honour our ancestors and how do we pay tribute to our ancestors today uh, that were so far removed from their contribution. And it, if I, would ch I would challenge uh, the thinking on that. Uh, we're not so far removed from the contributions of our ancestors. We are uh, intimately connected to those contributions. And now it's our turn uh, in this generation to carry the torch and move forward uh, in terms of uh, raising a, a awareness of our Chinese history and of our Chinese contribution. The Chinese have been in Canada since 1788 when 50 Chinese artisans came with John Mears in his sea otter ship off the coast of British Columbia. They also came during the 1850s to mine gold. They came with their children, their family. But the most important thing that they did, the Chinese, was to help build the British Columbia section of the Canadian Pacific Railway in the 1880s. This is the foundation in which the community's future, Canada's future, is being built.